sometimes I get so mad that Roe v. Wade was overturned that it makes me want to throw a hairbrush, like I did in the 1970s when my staff told me I was difficult to work with. But then I remember, I'm a Wonder Woman. I have my gold lasso that can make people tell the truth. I have a weekly TV show. I even have an invisible airplane. And I also have these amazing wrist bracelets that can deflect anything. Bullets, rocks, wasps, arrows. The only thing they can't deflect is when the Republicans want to tell me what to do with my uterus. I can't believe we are in this next millennium and we have fewer rights than we did in the 1970s when I was on TV. But in Ohio, we're trying to fix that. In Ohio, we are working very hard to put the Reproductive Rights Amendment petition on the ballot for November. But the Republicans are putting one more thing in our path. Time for the wrist brace again. Issue one is designed to make it harder for the Reproductive Rights Amendment to pass, and they're trying to put it on the ballot in August. So, if, actually they are putting it on the ballot in August, it's going to be there. So, if you want a little rhyme to help you remember, vote no in August and yes in November. Hello everybody, welcome to another episode of Living Figuratively. This is the show that asks the question, why not fill your home with the fascinating faces and figures of people that you don't even know? Why not fill your home with figurative art? Today, I'm bringing you to the absolutely gorgeous Ashtabula Art Center, which is just off I-90 in on the very eastern border of um, Ohio. And my, my show here is the Goddess Project Warriors. You may remember the Goddess Project because I've been working on it for about five years. It's where I take a look at the characters from the mythology of all the religions through a contemporary feminist lens. Behind me are the only two pro-choice goddesses in this show, and I'm gonna tell you just a quick thing about them. Basically, for these ones, I took the classic, iconic Michelangelo's David pose, where Michelangelo's David has a slingshot and a rock, and he is like this. Yeah, like this. And, but, it's, it's the classic underdog takes down the giant, takes down the uh, Goliath pose. And I switched it to a female, a woman taking on the patriarchy as symbolized by the American flag. The two paintings are My Body, My Decision and Trust Women. And they are sort of, they are sort of mate paintings, but both of them, the uh, hangers are festooning and piercing the flag along with my um, pro-choice messages, which I have done as, uh, as uh, my, part of my pro-choice activism, where I would take the uh, hangers with messages on them and hang them on the gates of the Ohio State House. I'm not doing that anymore because right now I'm working towards the uh, Reproductive Rights Amendment, which is basically being trying to be thwarted by the guys down in the State House. But anyway, so let's, let's give a walk through the Goddess Project Warriors. Um, this is the beautiful front desk where now everybody has cleared out. I've got some prints for sale here. Um, and I'm gonna take you over to a cheerier subject than the loss of our reproductive rights. These are my Burden of Talia paintings. So in Greek mythology, the muse Talia, T-H-A-L-I-A, is the muse of cheerfulness. There are nine muses and they inspire all kinds of wonderful things. They inspire all kinds of creativity. There's ones for astronomy, for memory, for history, three of them for song and dance, um, and one for cheerfulness and comedy, which is Talia. So I have taken a, a real life person who is uh, absolutely the, the most enthusiastic, fun person that I know, um, and she's posed for it. Her hair is, I've depicted it the way her hair actually is, where she has a dark side and a light side to show that we both, we all have a dark side and a light side. 
And the reason that the penguins are called the bird in the Talia, because sometimes the person keeping everybody else cheerful does so at great cost to herself. So here she is, overwhelmed by her masks. Um, because I love the image so much, I did a left one and a right one. We've got levity on the left, reverie on the right. So let's keep walking. I'm going to show you some more. Take you around the rest of the uh, Goddess Project Warriors. Sort of the centerpiece of the Goddess Project Warriors is my Love Athena triptych, which I've actually, if you go back through my Living Figuratively archives on YouTube, I actually have devoted three whole episodes during COVID to this painting. So I'm not going to talk too much about it, but the Love Athena triptych. I recast Athena, who in mythology has been this jealous god. Um, she's very vengeful of women that do better things than her and that are smarter than her or prettier than her or more creative than her. And she's always smiting them instead of supporting them. And um, my conjecture with this whole thing is that, that when women support each other and are staying in solidarity with each other, great things can happen. Groups of wise women should be ruling and running things. And that's what the Love Athena triptych is all about. I've got a mother and child in there. I've got several generations. I've got different women who have posed for my Chicks with Balls um, project who have gone through some major changes. I have uh, Shannon, who is a transgender woman, who when she first posed, she was at the very beginning of her transition process, and now she is fully 100% living, living as a woman. And, and so it's, a, it's sort of a coming together, women you know, supporting each other kind of a, kind of a tri triptych painting. So let's keep on, keep on moving. This whole gallery is huge, and I'm so thrilled that all of my triptychs from the Goddess Project can be shown together in this space. Um, I'm going to bring you over right here. These were the first ones that I did for the Goddess Project, uh, the Athena, because God, the Goddess Athena, of course, is one of the most popular of the uh, Greek mythological goddesses, and she's always shown as this fleshy pale, luxurious woman, you know, powdering her nose in her boudoir, just waiting for the man, like she's all sexual and everything. Um, when I researched Athena a little bit more, I found that she was way more than that. She was more of a, um, a peacekeeper and a positive influence, uh, tempering the swagger of her counterpart, which is the god of war, which is, who is Mars. So what I've done is my two interpretations. I've presented her as a black woman who is basically giving her gifts to the, a very ungrateful world, which is the, you know, the, the lot of many black women. Um, but she's still hopeful and continues to give her gifts to the world. Um, this one right here, uh, it's Athena, no, <laughs> it's Venus given and taken, I presented her as an older woman who has give, spent her life being drained by all she has given to the world, and yet she still continues. Both of them have a halo behind their head, which is the uh, planet Venus. Um, and there's lots more. There's lots more details in all these, which you can find many of those details in my Goddess Project book, which is for sale here at the show. Over here we have Medusa, who is a very popular mythological, Greek mythological figure. Um, Medusa's story, the, my paintings here are called hashtag MeDusa2. Uh, these were some of the ones that I painted when the Me Too movement was just kind of getting, getting a lot of publicity. Um, the Medusa story is a uh, vic rape victim blaming story because back in the, her, before she was the, you know, the snake-headed Gorgon that we all know Medusa to be, she was a beautiful young woman. And she had the unfortunate situation where the god Poseidon became obsessed with her and trapped her and raped her in Athena's temple. Athena, the goddess Athena, the jealous, vengeful god, instead of blaming 
the rapist blamed the victim, Medusa, and said that she, because of her beauty, that's why she brought this upon herself. And um, so Athena said, no man shall ever look at her again, and then turned her into the snake-headed Gorgon. For my paintings, I've given Medusa her beauty back, and I've also made the snakes into decorative accessories as opposed to evil things that turn people to stone. So those are my Medusa paintings. Over here, it's not just Greek mythology that I take on. I take on Judeo-Christian stories as well. Um, this triptych is called the Godfather Trilogy. Each one of them, uh, each one of the paintings depicts a miraculous or immaculate conception where a god impregnates a mortal woman. So the first one is from Greek mythology. This is Leda and the Swan, which is a very popular image in classical Renaissance art. Everybody loves painting Leda and the Swan, and there's all different interpretations. A lot of them make it seem like it's more of a seduction, but it's really a pretty scary, impossible sex act. So it is absolutely a rape. Um, in my painting, I show I show Leah as already pregnant, quite pregnant, where she had no options, no agency, no choices. She's having the baby, and she looks right into the eyes of the swan and says, yes, I know. And um, she's also concerned on the horizon is uh, the thousand ships, because the baby that she is pregnant with is will grow up to be Helen of Troy, who inspired the uh, Trojan War, which took tens of thousands of lives when there weren't that many people on Earth way back, way back in the day. So that's her, Helen of Troy is the face that launched a thousand ships. And I've got the uh, sunset in there. I've also tackled, and I believe this is the first character from Judeo-Christian mythology, or from Christian mythology that I've, uh, that I've painted. Um, this is Mary who had the immaculate conception where she was pregnant with baby Jesus. And it, there was no rape act des described in the Bible, so it was really more of a unwitting um, artificial insemination. She had to be informed by the angel Gabriel that she was pregnant. And at the time, she was already married to Joseph, so it was a little... It was a little funny, I, you know, there's holes in the story, just like there are in all the mythological stories. But she also I, um, has the look of concern where she's, she's worried about what will be happening to the son that is in her, in her belly right now. I've got the three crosses on the, um, on the horizon. And, um, and basically, it's, the, it's not only the concern of what will happen to her son, but also the concern for how his very peaceful, sweet, and kind words will go on to be twisted by evil people for their own ends over the next several millennia. So that's, that's part of what I... And she's also got the, I've got the halo in the background. She has not yet stepped into the halo. Most... Um, most uh, paintings, like the Byzantine paintings with the big gold halo, she's got the halo on and everything, and she hasn't yet stepped into it because she's conflicted, but she's, she's doing it. She's having the baby. The third one right here in the middle is Isis, who actually has, is the most empowered of the three who are impregnated by a, um, by a god. Um, Isis was the wife of the a great king in ancient Egypt. And um, the great king, her husband, was murdered by his brother. This is an old story. It happens in Hamlet, happens in um, the, the Lion King, all that. You know, it's the brother murdering the, the king so that the brother can be the king um, before an heir is born. And so she knows that in order to save the kingdom, she's got to produce an heir. So with the help of the gods, she resurrects her husband, and then she has to resurrect her husband, and she becomes pregnant. She makes herself pregnant, and she gives birth to Osiris, I believe, who became one of the great um, kings of Egypt that ordered, that brought order to the universe, and, you know, all was well. He's 
I'm going to say he's kind of like their iconic Jesus character. So she was the most empowered of the three, and I feel like her expression do, does that. She's not, she's not conflicted. She's happy that she was able to, you know, save her country by making herself pregnant. So let's keep on, keep on going around. Here we have the Arachne triptych, and Arachne, like Medusa, was one of the ones who was um, a victim of Athena's jealous rage. So uh, with Arachne's story, Arachne was a really, really good weaver at the time, a tapestry weaver. And she boasted about what a great weaver she was. And the word of her boasting got up to Mount Olympus and Athena heard and she was really ticked off and she didn't want somebody else to be a better weaver than her. So she challenged her to a weaving contest. They had the weaving contest. Athena's weaving was beautiful and you know showed the glory of the gods. Arachne's weaving was way more skilled, but it also showed the gods as mortal, petty, jealous creatures. It was, I'm thinking it was more like a harmonious Bosch type thing where she shows the gods being, you know, bad essentially. Um, but it was a beautiful weaving. Athena got really, really mad and ripped up Arachne's weaving. Arachne, fearing what was gonna happen to her, went to run and hang herself so that Athena couldn't kill her. Athena, with great false fanfare, said, oh no, 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 and pulled her down from where she was hanging and said, no, 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 you're such a superior weaver. I want you to weave for all eternity. And with that, she turned her into a spider. So I have shown Arachne before the magic is completely taken over and while she still has humanity, but she's getting ready to weave the spider web. And um, this is also one of the reasons why I had to paint the Love Athena triptych where I want to rebrand Athena as a good character instead of a bad one because that reputation of the jealous, vengeful woman hurts women also. So, the next one. This one is Emily, the Tenth Muse. Um, I told you about the muses with uh, when I was talking about Talia. We've got cheerfulness, we've got astronomy, we've got three for song and dance, we've got poetry, we've got history. We don't have a muse for the visual arts, inexplicably. So, I decided to create the muse for the visual arts. Emily, the real life Emily, is the biggest art patron you've ever seen. She, I've seen her at every single art opening. This was pre-COVID. Post-COVID, I see her at like every other art opening. Um, she, she's the, a wonderful patron of the arts and appreciator of all things, you know, inspirational. And she just lit, walks the walk, literally. So. When she offered to pose for me, I was like, I'm gonna find you a, uh, a, mu a, uh, a Greek goddess, and the muse for the visual arts was perfect. So I've given her a Mandela with, um, with uh, paintbrushes on it, much like Sargent's painting of um, Isabella Stewart Gardner that hangs in the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum, where she's got this Mandela behind her head with not paintbrushes, but it's a pattern on it. And Emily is holding the, her hands the same way that, uh, that Isabella Stewart Gardner is in her painting. The other thing, she, Emily has on her wrist the paper bracelet from Front Triennial, which is the every three year art festival that happens in Cleveland every summer, every three years in the summer. And Emily signed up for it and got her wrist bracelet and went to probably every single possible venue. So that's, that was part of her, her story. The next two right here are Eve and Pandora. So Eve and Pandora have also similarities. Um, they're both, one, you know, Eve is from the Judeo-Christian Bible and Pandora is, I'm sorry, Pandora is, Eve is from the Judeo-Christian Bible. Pandora is from Greek mythology. Um, but both of them have a similar story. And there's a lot of that cross-cultural stories, which is basically due to the um, 
conquerings and border shifting and, and um, cultural appropriation. Uh, people took the different stories and uh, wrapped them up into their own religion and beliefs and, and went on their way. Uh, Pandora, essentially, was the, her, her story is she was the first mortal woman created in the Greek mythology. Zeus created her as a, and this is a misogynistic twist, Zeus created her as a punishment for the men that he was ticked off at. There, were, oh, there weren't any women on earth. There was just men, and they were all having fun and everything. Um, so he created the first mortal woman as a disruptor for their fun because maybe they weren't doing things right or you know Zeus was also a jealous vengeful god um, and as soon as he created her he gave her one directive which was here's a box that you're not allowed to open that's the only rule she had to live by and of course she was intellectually curious so she opened the box all hell broke loose the box released every kind of you know, evil demon into the world, the only thing left in the box was hope. Same story with Eve. Okay, Eve, first mortal woman created. As soon as she was created, the Judeo-Christian God said, you shall, you know, you can live in the Garden of Eden, enjoy everything, but you cannot eat fruit from this tree, the tree of knowledge. Eve, being intellectually curious, broke that rule and took a bite from the tree of knowledge. And guess what happens? All hell breaks loose, they get banished from, from, from the Garden of Eden, and God even throws in a supper and childbirth clause for Eve specifically, and all women to come. So basically the lesson of both these stories is women do not seek knowledge, just obey and don't seek knowledge. That is a very damaging myth in my opinion and everybody reasonable's opinion. So I have switched up these myths. I have shown Eve delighting in what she finds in the box, for she has found, it's a box from Amazon, back when Amazon sold books, she has found all kinds of books which represent knowledge. She's found an old, beautiful Bible. I have my mom's book, which she wrote about one view of the afterlife in there. And, as a not, and I have uh, Toni Morrison's Song of Solomon in there. I have an old photo album. Um, and the last book that she pulls out of the box is Obama's Audacity of Hope. Kind of a nod to the whole hope being left, the last one left in the box. Um, and with Eve, she's also delighting in the knowledge she has found by taking a bite out of the apple. And not only that, she has taken a bite out of many apples. The snake is kind of a nobody. He's just this little bit player. And she's looking at all kinds of books. And in fact, the book that she is reading is Edith Hamilton's mythology book, the one that we all read in high school that eliminated all the dirty stories because there's plenty of those too. So I've shown the positive spin. And I've also represented Eve and Pandora as the same person, um, a beautiful black woman who, why the heck wouldn't the first woman, mortal woman created be, be black? So that is another part of the mythology that I have taken and reinterpreted. This painting right here, okay, this one is Mary as Luna, goddess of Dung Beetle Falls. So it's a multifaceted story here. Uh, Mary Pose for my Chicks with Balls project, where I ask women of strength and courage, ordinary women, women that you, you know, that, that I knew and that approached me or that were my friends, um, to pick a ball to represent their str strengths and struggles, and to pose with it covering their covering their breasts because most women I know don't want to pose nude. So Mary was in the interesting position where she had a double mastectomy. So she actually didn't have breasts. Um, and that was a conscious choice that she chose to not have the reconstructive surgery after her breast cancer because she was just like, enough is enough with the surgery. And um, one of the things that she, she chose the dung beetle ball because the industrious, wonderful little dung beetle, they take literally the poop of other animals 
and roll it into positive action. They build nests in there for their young. They use it as food. They, and they follow the stars and roll it in one direction to get the poop into a bigger and bigger and bigger ball. What I've rolled into Mary's ball are the, um, the, the words of the naysayers who basically, and many of them from the medical community, who basically did not agree with and made it very known uh, her decision to stay breastless. They, they told her things like, you know, they, they practically wanted her husband to sign a permission form so that he would accept a breastless wife. Um, and so I saw that as the shit of others that she rolled into her dung beetle ball. And because they, the dung beetles use the, the moon and the, uh, and the stars to, uh, to guide their rolling, I sort of merged her with the goddess Luna, who's the one who drives her chariot across the sky and brings the moon. So Mary's halo is the moon. And she definitely belongs in my Goddess Project as well. I'm going to finish up. This is the last painting from the Goddess Project. In fact, it was the last one that I finished. Um, this one is called Necessary Evil. And it is basically what I, my conjecture is that God needs the devil as a good cop, bad cop situation. Because admonishments to be good don't carry any weight if you don't have bad consequences. And the devil is the one that does the bad consequences. When God says, you have to do this, and you don't do it, the punishment is always that you're going to go to hell, and the devil's going to poke at you, and it'll be hot and fiery, and you know, and it, everything could be horrible down there. So my conjecture is that you really do need both. It's a, it's a balance. Um, God can't be all good without somebody on the other side to say, you know, no, you're also going to be punished um, if you're not good. What I have shown, though, since the two kind of have to work together instead of being in opposition, I have shown God and the devil as being old friends, old women hanging out over coffee. They, their buddies, they are talking about strategizing how they're going to fix the problems in the world. And yes, we do have many, many, many problems in the world. Um, they're at their disposal are apples of temptation, um, locusts. I have a whole bunch of locusts because remember the, all the locust plagues and stuff like that. I have frogs. They have plague, plagues of frogs. Um, over here, God is, and you can tell this one's God. She's got the white bathrobe and the devil has the red bathrobe. Um, she's got the Holy Grail tipped over, essentially saying that the, you know, peace on earth and everything being in harmony is kind of the Holy Grail that we're all looking for. Um, in this one, we've got, uh, we've got the, the cheeky devil trying on the halo because, you know, the big story is that the, the devil was an angel at some point and he tried to take over and got cast out. Um, because he tried to take over. He didn't, God didn't want his military coup. Um, so he, you know, cast him out, which would make sense in, in our country too, in our politics, but we're not going to get political here. Um, he's got, or she's got, the uh, feathers from when she was an angel, but it's a little bit raggedy now. She's also got the snake that, um, that is sort of a common motif. It's the same, my, the model for this snake is a, is a nice rubber snake that I got uh, at a, you know, at a toy store. Um, and then the feather, feathers flying. She's trying on the halo, but ultimately surrenders it back to God um, because, you know, God is the one that gets the halo. And over here we've got God thinking and looking. And um, this, this painting has gotten into a little bit of trouble, and I'm wondering if perhaps the person who has, is, I'm going to call her the dissenter, um, is watching all the way to the end of this video, because she actually, she actually has very, very thoroughly researched my, my work and has watched many of my videos, um, and has brought up some very, very interesting discussions as to how I depict some of these some of these things, especially the characters from the Judeo-Christian Bible. 
um, which I literally, I mean, absolutely no disrespect whatsoever. I'm basically just being an artist and looking at things from a different lens. And I think that the highest form of belief would be to actually look at something analytically, make decisions about it, and actually convince yourself that you believe this or believe that, instead of blindly saying, this is how it has to be, period. So what I'm offering as an artist, I'm not saying this is how you should, this is how you should picture God right now. This is, this is not even how I necessarily picture God. These are two wonderful women that I knew, that I know, who were very kind to pose for me. Um, because all my paintings have real life models that pose for them. I would take photographs of them, but it, they always start with a real person. I don't make up people. Um, so this is really just one idea. And um, perhaps your image of God is the one that Michelangelo painted. Perhaps your image of God is the one that Bouguereau painted. Perhaps your image of God is one that a anonymous African artist painted. You, it's whoever you picture, and I'm an artist, and I'm just offering a concept. Uh, so hopefully, hopefully that nobody will take any disrespect from from these images. Um, and I uh, and I want to say thank you now. Thank you all for joining me and for sticking around till the very very end. This show is only here for one more week. Um, I'm picking up the works on Tuesday, August first. So. You might be able to sneak in Monday, July 31st and see the show, but it's technically only here until uh, Saturday the 29th. Um, it's a beautiful venue, it's a gigantic room, and this is probably the, it's the first time, and hopefully not the last time, but you never know, when all my Goddess Project triptychs are shown together. So, thank you all for joining me. I totally, totally appreciate it. I'm gonna say my little rhyme again, just so you remember, vote no in August, vote yes in November.